This is our chapter 8, lessons 1 and 2 video on confidence intervals, uh, estimating with confidence. So now we're, we're really looking at applying what we've learned about sampling distributions to uh, estimate a parameter in terms of proportions. So in chapter 7, we assumed we knew the parameter and based our work off of that. Um, basically, in order to see the relationship between a population distribution and a sampling distribution. Um, however, that is not the case in reality. We did that just to get an understanding of the relationship and how everything works in terms of estimating a true parameter. In reality, we, um, we don't know the parameter, and that's our whole goal, is to take a small and biased sample um, and determine a parameter. And in reality, we're looking at cost of doing that and all of these things. So we want to look at the lowest cost, which may be less the smallest sample size possible to get a good, accurate, unbiased estimate of the parameter. So we're going from p hat to p here, whereas in chapter 7 we went from p, the parameter, to p hat. Um, so we'll be checking conditions in terms of p hat as well, since we don't know the true parameter. So big questions to focus on. What is a confidence interval? Um, how do they relate to normal curves and sampling distributions? So think about that normal condition. Um, you want to look, think about confidence level, confidence interval, point estimate, standard error, and margin of error when you talk about those. So here's an example problem that I'll have you sum up in the free response at the end um, once we've gone over kind of the basics. So we had a sample of 7,833 high school students from 2011 and approximately 43% reported that they had texted while driving at least once in the last 30 days. We want to know the 95% confidence interval for the true proportion of teens who had texted while driving in the previous 30 days. And we'll look at how we can estimate that. So p hat or sample statistic will be our point estimator meaning it's our estimate, um, and we're hoping that it's close to the true proportion. If we have an unbiased sample that we took randomly and we have a large enough sample size. So our statistic is our point estimator. Our estimate, um, our estimate would be a range of values that we're, we're confident the true value falls within. So our confidence interval is going to have a point estimate plus or minus the margin of value, margin of error. So we'll have a value, p hat, plus or minus um, a certain range of values depending on the normal curve and depending on how, how confident we are. So they're different depending on the amount of confidence. So if we're 95% confident or 99% confident, and that confidence level relates to the percent of values um, under the normal curve. So it indicates how sure we are that this range is correct based on our normal calculations. So when we say we're 95% confident, we're saying 95% of all samples of a given size will result in an interval that captures the unknown parameter. So just looking at our, our confidence level, the amount of values within the, with, under the normal curve that cover the true value. So um, here's a little sentence filler I'd like you to use to interpret these as you start to use them. So we are, insert the confidence level, percent confident that the interval from, this would be our lower bound we get. So our point estimate minus the margin of error to our upper estimate, which would be the point estimate plus the margin of error, captures the actual value of the, whatever our population or parameter is for the problem. So we're saying that on a normal curve, the interval is centered around our point estimate with an area of 0.95 around the point estimate. Uh, so that doesn't include the top 2.5% and the bottom 2.5% of that normal curve, or 0.025, if we use it as a proportion. Um, the value that would correspond to that 95% is a z-score of 1.96, just under 2. So basically it's plus or minus 2 standard deviations. The exact value is slightly yes, less. So we'll have this formula on our formula, formula sheet, but statistic, that's our estimate, our proportion, plus or minus... That's the z-score right here, the critical value. So for 95%, it'll always be 1.96 times the standard deviation of the statistic. Now, again, the standard deviation will be calculated just like we did in Chapter 7, but instead of using p, we're using p hat because we don't know the true proportion. Um, we only know the sample statistic. So we'll have the square root of the quantity p hat times its complement, 1 minus p hat, divided by n, that whole quantity square rooted. Um, so let's take a look at what that looks like. So we check our calculations. We'd state all the important information about the problem, including what's known about the sample size and what the parameter of interest we're trying to estimate is. 
uh, we'd assume that we'd um, not assume we would check to see that we have our the random condition met so that we have an unbiased um, estimator so we know that the mean of the sampling distribution would be equal to the true mean if it's unbiased so if we have an SRS we good to go there the normal condition remember that this is going to vary this is going to change for sample means versus sample proportions uh, for sample proportions remember we're checking that n times p hat is greater than or equal to 10 and n times 1 minus p hat is greater than or equal to 10 now here's a little trick there you could just look at the um, number of yeses and the number of noes so example the number of people do you support um, candidate A for the next presidential election the number of people that say yes out of your sample size would have to be bigger greater than or equal to 10 and the number of people who say no would have to be greater than or equal to 10 um, and I'll show you that in our example problem how that works out with the n times p hat uh, basically because the proportion that we have the the denominator will be the um, will be the sample size so you just have to check the numerator um, independent Remember, we have to sample less than 10% of the population so that we can use our formulas for standard deviation. The condition is the same. The formula for standard deviation for proportions and sample means is different. So, so let's take a look at what this looks like. We'll have a point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. And we'll write that then as the lower bound, comma, upper bound in parentheses, where the lower bound is the point estimate minus the margin of error, and our upper bound is the point estimate plus the margin of error. So if I say that a candidate I'm 95% confident that a candidate um, is got 53% of the vote plus or minus 1.5%. Minus 1.5% would be 51.5%. Plus 1.5% would be 54.5%. So I'd like you to go back on that last little part and see if you can just pick out point estimate and interpret what this would be here. So a recent poll suggests that President Obama's approval rating, let's say it was 0.65 plus or minus 0.05 with 95% confidence. What does that mean? So pause right here. Feel free to look over your summary for 8.1 and answer the multiple choice. And then go on uh, for the rest of the lesson and answer the free response. So we're looking specifically at the details of a population proportion now. Um, remember that we want to check center, shape, and spread. So um, we have a random condition which, which refers to center. In the book, they're sometimes called center, shape, and spread. Those correspond to random, normal, and independent. So if we have an SRS, we know that p hat's an unbiased estimator of the population proportion. So the mean of all those p hats, all the, remember, one p hat from each sample, if we gather all of those, every possible sample the same size, average them out, it would equal the true proportion. Now here's a little difference. Because we don't have p, the true value, we're trying to estimate that. We check this with p hat. Because the denominator of p hat is n, basically you just check the, the numerator, the number of yeses, like I said before, and the complement, uh, the, you know, the sample size minus the numerator. As long as those are bigger than, greater than or equal to 10, we're good to go. Sample less than 10% of the whole population, so that with, since we're sampling without replacement, so our can probabilities still hold up and then we can use this formula for standard deviation. Now notice the difference here. We're not using this formula because we don't know p. We have to plug in p hat there. So p hat times its complement over n. So if the normal conditions met for a 95 percent confidence interval we use the critical value of 2. Uh, basically we use 1.96. We want to know two standard deviations above or below the mean. So 95 percent confidence isn't exactly 2. It's about 1.96. So we want to know 1.96 standard deviations above the mean, and that's our upper bound, and 1.96 standard deviations below the mean, because that's our lower bound. Now, because it's centered around the mean, that's the 90, it's, you know, it's the 2.5 percentile and the 97.5 percentile, because it's centered around the middle. So the tail has 2.5% on the left and right that aren't included in the 95% confidence interval. So here's a little visual of that. It's centered around the mean here. So when we are 95% confident, we're leaving this chunk off and this chunk off of the tail. So we got 95% of the values covered there. Now here's another way of color coding it, breaking it up a little more between plus one standard deviation and minus one. So we get this formula, p hat plus or minus our critical value, which is the z that corresponds to our confidence level, times our standard deviation. Our point estimate plus or minus, so point estimate on the left, this part in green and red here is our margin of error, which is the confidence level times the standard deviation of the statistic. 
The margin of error changes based on the confidence level. The standard error is what we call the standard deviation. And we'll use state, plan, do, and conclude for these. So what parameter P do you want to estimate and at what confidence level? All information. Plan, identify the appropriate inference method. Check those three conditions. Random, normal, independent. Do. If the conditions are met, perform the calculations. That gives me means you're identifying what the z-score is that's appropriate. You're solving for the margin of error. You want to write out point estimate plus or minus critical value times the standard deviation. And then you are concluding um, by interpreting your interval in the context of the problem. We are 95% confident that the actual, or you could use true, or population proportion falls within the interval of lower bound to upper bound for the, and then you describe the parameter. So here's our margin of error. If we want a, in reality what happens a lot of times is people want a margin of error defined beforehand. So they'll go ahead and estimate it based on plugging in 0.5 for p hat, which would be give us the largest standard error, and find what sample size they'd need to have a certain margin of error or less. So we can set this up uh, sometimes by determining what sample size we'd need. And we'll have a couple problems looking at that. So here's the problem from the beginning of the lesson about the number of high school students from 2011. Approximately 43% reported that they had texted while driving at least once in the last 30 days. We want the 95% confidence interval for the true proportion. So state, we want to estimate P equals the true proportion of teens who had texted while driving in the previous 30 days with 95% confidence. Uh, random. We have an SRS, so we have an unbiased estimator, and our data is representative of the population, meaning the mean of our sampling distribution of p hat equals the true proportion, unbiased estimator. Normal. Now here's the trick I was showing you there. See how the sample size is the same as the denominator, so those equal 1. We just have to look at the numerator here. So 3,368 is way bigger than 10. 4,465, we're then not driving. That's also bigger than 10. We're, def we're good. The normal conditions met. Our sampling distribution is approximately normal. Uh, then we have independent condition. We assume that there are at least 10 times the sample size, or 78,330 teenage, teenagers driving, which is reasonable. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Let's look at the do step, and then you're going to finish it off. So our confidence interval is given by our sample statistic plus or minus the critical scores times the standard error. Um, and you're given all of that. So for 95% confidence, we want to use 1.96 for the critical value here. So plug in 1.96 for z. Remember, p hat here was 0.43. Uh, plug in the sample size. Our sample statistic was the number, the proportion that pr reported texting in the last 30 days. So go ahead and plug in all the information we were given in this form, in this problem. For p hat, remember z star is 1.96. Add it for the upper bound, subtract it for the lower bound. Write out your calculations to show your work, and then the, write your answer, please in this format, lower parentheses, lower bound, comma, upper bound. And that's your free response. So go back, look at the vocabulary, um, look over the outline for 8.1, 8.2, and then answer this free response.